People look at me like I'm a, a terrible person. Oh my God, how could you do heroin? You shove needles up your arm, that's terrible. Um, but in general, everybody has, basically most people I know have had morphine at some point in their life. They have done heroin. Um, it's the, the same exact high. Um, I woke up and it went from something that was fun, that I was, I was doing from time to time, to something I needed. Acapulco, Mexico. This is Anarchast. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. I've got a great first time guest coming on. I actually uh, was, uh, I think Ed Bugos of the Dollar Vigilante told me about him and said, uh, you really need to watch his TED talk. He had a TED talk where he was talking about how he was addicted to heroin and a lot of the uh, things he went through and uh, very motivational. And that's actually what he's gone on to do since he got off heroin. He was on heroin for five or six years, uh, a, a heroin addict. And uh, he eventually got off. He had, went through the the uh, prison industrial complex system and uh, eventually um, uh, got clean off of that and became a sort of a motivational speaker, he even started up his own BMX company called Thriller BMX. They perform at uh, government indoctrination camps. They also perform at uh, a lot of uh, sporting events, which are the circuses of the, of the state system and all that sort of stuff. But he, he does it in a way that he's trying to help the kids and help a lot of people to be motivational about uh, things. So he's very motivational. Uh, if you haven't seen his TED Talk, we'll put a link to that down below. It's really good as well. And uh, uh, he's coming in from Ohio. That's where he was born, and he, he still lives in Ohio. And uh, Jason, it's a pleasure to have you on. First question I have to ask you, though, is how did you become an anarchist? Uh, thanks, Jeff. Um, how I became an anarchist. Uh, so I guess going through my childhood, I definitely just felt like I didn't have any intellectual self-defense going through the, the school system, but at the same time I had a very uh, very open mind. I had an awesome, uh, I was raised by two amazing hippies. I'm actually adopted as well. They were very anti-war. Uh, my mother was very anti-state. So that was uh, always always awesome, but I really didn't understand the system and, and I kind of had a low uh, opinion of people because I think that's what, when you're going through the school system, that's what you're told people are possibly bad, evil, but thank God we have this thing called government who can go in and uh, kill anybody at any time and do whatever it wants and, and you can't do that but they can because they always know what's right and and it's just a, it's, it's a mess. But I did know the word anarchism meant uh, without rulers. So knowing that and I, I did know everything also in my life that was good um, I, I grew up riding BMX bikes, so I went to public skate parks that were, were terrible. Um, and then I'd go to private, skate, private bike parks that were awesome. And I got the early lesson of public bad because central planning is bad, private good. Um, and then as time went on, I, I uh, got into drugs. Through riding BMX bikes, I got hurt quite a bit. I blew up my ACL. I broke my leg twice. Um, I've ruptured my spleen. Uh, I, ha I had a, like a, a year and a half where I was on a pick line for a staph infection in my bone. I had a, a lot of uh, really bad injuries and the whole time I was on opiates and I fucking, I fucking love drugs, you know, I absolutely did. It was a great escape from uh, this world to me. Um, so you're talking about things like Oxycontin and things yes, like that? Yes, ox Oxycontin, um, you know, and, and so when the, when the doctors put you on that, I basically, I, I went from, do, I'm about 20 at this point um, in my life, and I'd never have drank a beer in my life, I've never done anything, I, I got addicted to opiates, I loved the feeling of it because it was a, it was similar to riding, so it was, you're, you take this thing, you don't really have to work hard, and all of a sudden you feel like, you are invincible king of the world just like you worked really hard to learn something just like you accomplished something but you didn't accomplish anything you're actually just laying in your bed so i liked the escape of it um i liked it too much and then i was constantly on drugs for a, more than a few years but through that journey i got to go to rehab centers um and jails and prison and other institutions that I, but before I don't you go think on a little, I just want to just briefly just figure out because um, you're on OxyContin, which is like really heinous in my opinion. But that's a 
totally approved by the governments and doctors and Absolutely. all that kind of stuff. Uh, so how did you go from Oxycontin to heroin? Like, what, what was that step? Okay, so what, what's very interesting is that when uh, heroin actually, is, it go, let's go back a little bit. So heroin all the way back in the day was approved by uh, Bayer and Bayer brought it into the United States. If you Google that, you can find old pictures of it. And so when you look at uh, all through the history, it's basically drug after drug after drug, and it's supposed to, uh, heroin was supposed to get you off of uh, morphine. And then Oxycontin was supposed to be able to be the non-addictive uh, drug instead of using um, oxycodone. So now you're, you're able to use this special drug that's not addictive. They just do that over and over and over again. Um, now there'll be another one that comes out in a year, but right now it's Oxycontin. So basically, Oxycontin, um, if you, if you, and, and heroin, if you've ever been in a, in a hospital bed and you've been shot up with morphine, you have done heroin. It's, there's, there's not much of a difference, actually. Morphine is just um, actually better. It's pure. Um, it's, it's made in a pharmacy. It's perfect every single time. So when going to heroin, it's actually, you're, you're doing the same thing, basically. Um, just Oxycontin, maybe that's something you can shoot up. Um, and it's actually, Oxycontin is actually better and it's always in a good form and, and heroin is sometimes you get a bad batch of heroin. So you, what a lot of people don't know is that when you go and you're doing these drugs, you're actually basically doing heroin. But for me, people look at me like I'm a, a terrible person. Oh my God, how could you do heroin? You shove needles up your arm. That's terrible. Um, but in general, everybody has basically most people I know have had morphine at some point in their life. They have done heroin. Um, it's the the same exact high. So and then so anyways, I got from point A to point B. Um, I you basically through jails. You you go to jail. You go to rehab. Uh, they they tell you that jails is place where people turn around and they do great with their life and they they turn around their life and they become perfect people. But all you do is meet other people who do other bad shit like you do. And so when I got out, I met other people who did harder drugs than me. And I was at the time, I was mainly doing Oxycontin. So then I started doing heroin with them. Um, and so that's, that's how that happened. And then you, it's, a, it's a very long road. I think that's the thing nobody really uh, gets is that you don't just go from, hey, I wanna, I wanna be an addict, I'm gonna start doing heroin. You start with, you, maybe you take a couple painkillers a day. Um, maybe you take it on the weekend. Next week you drink it with a couple beers. Next week it's Wednesday and you're like, you know what, maybe I'll have a couple. And then one day I felt like I, wake, I woke up and I was different. Um, I woke up and it went from something that was fun, that I was, I was doing from time to time, to something I needed. Um, and that was when it kind of all fell through. Um, that's when I, I started doing things that I never thought I'd do in my entire life, um, upsetting people that I loved, hurting people. Um, it just became a, a, an obsession and a need. And it, it's just like other people would need to eat, I needed heroin. And that's what usually happens in people's brains when they are addicts. They, they, they ch it changes, it go it's your survival centers in your brain fighting to tell you, you need this, do whatever you have to do to get it. Yeah, uh, very interesting that you started off with uh, having a number of injuries and then the doctors, the guys with white lab coats who <laughs> usually kill most people that they come into contact with, uh, got you addicted to basically opiates uh, without, uh, you probably had no idea how addictive those things are, I would guess, right? Because most people don't. I had no idea too until my mom came down from Socialist Canada uh, medical system and uh, we went to the doctor and I said, okay, they've got her on about 50 different pills here. And he's like, whoa, she, like half these pills counteract each other. This is crazy. He got her down to like three. And he's like, one of the pills she's on is Oxycontin. And uh, we can't actually prescribe that here in Mexico. Uh, and I said, oh, okay. So is there something else that replaces it? He says it's for pain. And I said, okay, so what replaces it? He says, well, actually, really nothing that we can prescribe replaces it. Um, and we can't prescribe it. And I was like, oh, okay, so I guess I'll give her a bunch of Tylenol or something. He's like, I don't know, but good luck. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, uh, she's probably going to try to kill herself. <laughs> I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, a lot of Americans come down to the U.S. They're on these Oxycontin things and um, <clears throat> they can't get it here. 
And they actually will go crazy. They'll start jumping out of their hotel windows and everything. Oh, and man. so she had a really rough few days, but she did get through it. She actually hadn't been on them that long, so that was lucky. Yeah. Uh, but most people have no idea. So you got put into this by the system, you know, the pharmaceutical yeah. industrial complex. Uh, you, you ended up getting kind of addicted to it. It got to the point where you ended up in jail at some point. The jail system just introduced you. This is the government and uh, jail uh, yeah. prison industrial complex. Introduced you to a bunch of other guys who got problems. Now you're hanging out with a bunch of bad guys, and they're like, hey, why don't you try heroin? Now you're on heroin, uh, you know, all caused generally by, you could say the system or even just the culture, but the system itself is kind of uh, set up this way. Whereas when you listen to a lot of the propaganda of government, they're like, well, we need all these things so that we, because there's this problem and we have to stop it. It's like, well, you're causing most of those problems. Yes. And, th and that's, where, <laughs> that's where it gets very interesting. Um, so... Like what you said with with um, your mother and all these people, um, they we have no idea. Most people don't have any idea. Um, and you you talk about things like dare, okay? So we got dare. So dare tells you what drugs are basically. They don't they don't tell you that hey, like when you do get an injury, maybe you want to be a little bit uh, safe when you're doing things like oxycotton or things like that because it is basically heroin. You can end up addicted very very easily. And that's the thing. I mean, I know tons and tons of people who got who have the same exact story that I do and it's it, it's one thing like yes the the system is what it is but it's another thing that's saying there there's no education towards this nobody nobody's learning this you go through 12 years of your uh, schools and your indoctrination camps and then when you get out um, you don't know anything about things that really pertain to your life, things that can save you. So that's what we, we do that at a lot of uh, a lot of events. We do have drug free events and things like that. And it, and it is really cool to be able to be on the other side. Um, I'm, I'm over I'm about eight years sober now. So to be on the other side of that, able to talk to kids and help other people people get over the, these problems and at least wake them up to that, hey, uh, this, this system is completely made, uh, tailored for you. I mean, you could go back to Iran-Contra, you go back before that, uh, in World War II we actually had um, basically zero addicts in the United States because we locked down the docks um, through, and then we decided to open it up to the mafia. Um, this is between the CIA and uh, the mafia, they open up the docks, we start bringing in drugs in the United States, that goes on and on and on, and, and, now, and then we get into Iran-Contra, and then the, the entire scandal, and then that's, that's all a big joke, and they make a movie about it called uh, you know, American Made with Tom Cruise, and he's laughing, and, and you think it's, it's just hilarious, but at the same time, that's, that's very real shit. And at the same time, they, they left out so much of that. Like uh, Barry Seal goes all the way back to the Bay of Pigs. Bay, Barry Seal wasn't just a green kid who they picked up when he was flying airplanes and flying commercial. They picked him up when he was a kid, basically found out that he would fly arms into just about anywhere. He was down for adventure. Um, he was working with the CIA, Escobar, wh whoever, whoever was, was uh, to sell drugs. He went into Cuba. He went into Central America. He gets in the Iran-Contra scandal. Um, you know, but they only show a little bit about that in the movie, and then they show him falling. Uh, <laughs> his plane crashes, and then he's covered in uh, cocaine, and you know they, that everybody's laughing. But at the same time, that 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 never happened. But the real story is much more interesting. I would I would say anybody who's interested in it should really look into the Barry Seal story. There's tons of stuff. I mean, he knew George W. Bush. Uh, he he knew all of the, all of these people all the way into the Reagan White House. But and then and then magically he ended up dead and somehow he's gone. And then Gary Webb comes out with his story and then he's dead. And and, and you know it's it's a very interesting thing because you, you as you go on you see 2008 happens and then you see. Uh, what was it? The Guardian had a good article about money laundering basically propping up the economy at that point. Catherine Austin Fitz, uh, the secretary of HUD under Bush, wrote a bunch about that as well, uh, money laundering and drug money. I mean, it, I think she has an article called Narco Dollars for Dummies, which is very enlightening. So it's when you really go through that, what you said about it being basically tailor-made for you to get addicted to drug, like, yeah, it, it really is. <laughs> 
Yeah, not to mention that 9-11 uh, was, uh, before 9-11, there was, which was a false flag attack by Dick Cheney and the Bush family and all these people, uh, the uh, Afghanistan the, is the largest uh, place with uh, poppies, uh, which is where opium's made from. And they actually, the production was going down year after year. And uh, after 9-11, of course, the USSA, uh, the, the Empire, the Department of Offense, the Pentagram, all attacked Afghanistan. And all of a sudden, the uh, uh, poppy opium production went up dramatically after that. That's because the CIA is actually the biggest drug cartel in the world by far. And it's actually in, in uh, concert with the Clinton crime family, with the Bush crime family. Uh, it's pretty funny watching people talking about Mexican cartels and how bad they are. It's like, those guys are small time compared to the CIA yeah. and the Bush <laughs> and the Clinton crime family. <laughs> well, it's, it's very interesting uh, because you're you're getting at the the heart of it and you're also seeing that in 2008 the the UN came out with a document that was stating that basically um, the Mujahideen came in at a certain point before we got there and started burning up all of the fields um, got rid of heroin in Afghanistan and then opium production went up by 95 percent after we got there and I have, and that's, it, that's in a UN report as well, I have so many friends who've come back and told me, hey, you know, like, I had to get out of ser the service because basically I was there guarding poppy fields. Like, they were there running around, and, and there's tons of pictures of that, I, I know, but it's crazy to actually hear it from the horse's mouth. They literally went there to guard the poppy fields and make sure uh, opium production gets around on time, and they, they get the CIA or whoever is getting their shipments as needed. And the other thing people don't look at is how, uh, how good, how much profits you can make from something like heroin. Um, gold, yes, you can stack it. it it's heavy. Um, heroin, cocaine, if, if you stack a plane full of it, uh, you're talking about a ton of money. So they're, of course, they would like to bring that in there. They'd like to do whatever they possibly can to make money, fund things on the outside. Uh, and, and then there's all types of other ways of them laundering it. And so you, you get to see kind of a, an angle of it. And that's kind of what I saw when I started leaning towards anarchism and uh, also Austrian economics is that I'm seeing this entire system that is absolutely 110% broken. And as it's broken, I'm seeing that there, there's no way for most people to end up except for just slaves. And, and, and a lot of people are, they like it. Some of the slaves uh, really, if we were having this conversation in a coffee shop, somebody might come up to us and say, you know what, that's really un-American of you to say. That's pretty fucked up. You shouldn't say that because they, they've got the sheep basically trained to attack anybody who attacks what they believe in. Uh, it's, it's a really crazy thing right now. Yeah, everything's pretty crazy. Uh, as we mentioned, just the fact that uh, the entire drug industry is really run by the CIA and, and, and the U.S. government. And to an extent, a lot of people will say, well, how could the U.S. government do it? They're a bunch of idiots, these bureaucrats. They can't do anything right. The people who work at the DMV. It's not the people at the DMV who are running these things. Yes. It, it's the high-level CIA people that you've never heard of and you never will hear of uh, who are doing things like 9-11 and, and the drug trade and all that kind of stuff. And then, of course, the same people own the media. So they go on there. And it's like, well, good thing for Donald Trump. He's going to get rid of Mexican drug cartels. It's like <laughs> because of the well, wall. <laughs> yeah, with a wall. <laughs> yeah, you can't you can't jump over it or dig under it or go around it. To, it's there's, impossible. there's not but, an but, entire but, thing called the Gulf of Mexico, or you know, like you can't you definitely can't get in a boat. But somehow well, he, people really believe that this guy is is he's in there. He's going to fix everything. He's going to get rid of all these <laughs> drug problems. Uh, it, it's insane. Not to mention every now and then a CIA plane crash lands and it's just full of heroin. Yeah. <laughs> and they'd have to, it's not on the news or anything, but you can find the information out there. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah so this, the whole system's totally screwed. And, you know, to an extent with you becoming addicted, I, I, this is a question for you. You became addicted to heroin after being addicted to the government uh, doctor drugs, which are the same thing, basically. 
Um, to an extent, do you think uh, addiction is uh, somewhat caused by the system? And in your case, it definitely was because it was caused by the doctors giving it to you originally and not really telling you what, what you were getting. Uh, but like just this whole crazy system we live in, do you think that drives a lot of people towards wanting to use other substances, whether it be, and we could be talking about alcohol, we could talk about heroin, we could be talking about food, we could be talking about sex, we could be talking about video games. There's a whole bunch of people addicted to video games now. Pornography, that's another addiction. Do you think to an extent that's all sort of driven by this whole system itself? Well, this, the system is made to create people who don't have control, um, especially if you look at it from, from our standpoint, on an anarchist standpoint, is that as time has gone on, you had a beautiful period called the Enlightenment. Um, you had people saying that, hey, for once in, in our entire history, uh, man should be free. You had Newton come out with his laws, which led to uh, natural law, which led to Spinoza, which led to Thomas Paine, and these people saying man, man deserves to be free. We have all this freedom. We're doing very well. We did we did awesome going through that. Granted, we had terrible things going on at the same time, but you know, slavery that's a whole another another subject. But I'm just saying we we had more freedom than we definitely have now, and. <clears throat> Working forwards through that, um, yeah, I lost my train of thought. About how this system might cause uh, people to uh, end up being addicted to things? Yes, Jeff, I, I do think that a lot of that is caused by the system. When you, people don't have freedom. They don't have freedom to choose. Um, they don't have freedom to, to do anything. They just have freedom to go to work, um, Hopefully you collect your paycheck. You definitely can't question your taxes because if you question that, then you're you're a piece of shit, uh, and you'll probably get thrown in jail. So you don't you don't have power over your own life really. You you can't just jump into things. You can't start a business if you just want to start a business. You have to go through and ask the king for permission to do just about anything. Um, so I do believe the system because you don't have freedom. One thing you do have freedom for, uh, if you talk to any anorexic, mostly what they talk about is that they can control what goes into their body. They can control when they eat. Um, that and I think it's it's a it's a rat race no matter what. Um, when you're when you're waking up every day and you feel like shit because nobody who's an addict wants to be an addict it's the worst feeling in the world your your stomach feels like it's falling out of you 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 can't think you don't even know who you are no, nobody wants to be an addict but you get up every day and you do have something to focus on something to go after um, and, and and as terrible as it is and as hard as it is i think in some form of way that's that's a control thing i think they're trying to grab some form of control in a world where there there is none and look at it in the sense of if, let's say, somebody who has a lot of pain and they said, look, we're, when you're in the hospital, we're obviously going to be doing surgery on you, so we're going to give you morphine. But at the same time, um, marijuana is legal. So you're going to go home and you're going to do this drug that really nobody gets addicted to, nobody kills each other over, and definitely nobody overdoses on. So we're going to give you, you know, some of that. And, and, and if you really opened up those doors, and, and I'm not a person who smokes, but I really do see the benefits of it. If you really do open those doors, um, you really do see that people get choices. And when they get choices, they have a lot more control over their life. And they don't have a tendency of going, you know, down a, down a bad path because they have control over themselves. Yeah, um, a lot of people, I just watched a Louis C.K. Uh, clip, he was on Conan O'Brien or something, but uh, he was talking about how we, uh, you know, a lot of things in our lives today are so easy, right? Like we have all this technology, uh, you know, we're not living in dirt and, and we have like running, almost everyone has, you know, running water and uh, indoor plumbing and all that kind of stuff and air conditioning or whatever else. And uh, his whole point of the, the thing was that we have so many things today, but no one's happy. And I think a big part of it, there, I think there's two parts to it. I think part of it is a lot of people have really lost touch with sort of, I don't want to use the word spirituality, but even just being connected to like the earth, like hardly anyone goes out and swims in the ocean anymore as much. They're on their computer all day or whatever, right? And they're, they're less connected to their food. They're not making the food. They're not anything. It just comes delivered from Uber Eats and stuff, right? So this whole connected to life sort of thing, a lot of people have kind of gotten less connected. And then at the same time, as you just pointed out, pretty much everyone's living as a slave today. That's a, that's a good reason why a lot of people are unhappy. Um, I, 
I actually don't have a ton of time left. I have about 10 minutes, and I wanted to get into uh, addiction stuff because this is something that I find very interesting. It's something that uh, I've gone through uh, similar things in my life and uh, gotten through them. Uh, and uh, the whole idea of addiction is kind of a, a, a weird one to me. Like a, a lot of them, a lot of the, the establishment that they call it like a disease now, uh, which is kind of funny because it's not a disease. It's not something you catch. It's, 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 it's what I found is when I was doing a, a lot of drinking and a lot of other things like that, it was mostly because I was very, very unhappy. Uh, and a lot of people are kind of like that and they kind of go to these things because they're very unhappy for the reasons we just pointed out. Uh, but for those people out there who may be having addiction problems right now, this is something you can uh, speak on quite well. What would be sort of your general advice to them? Um, I think the, the reason why, and I think it's, it's where this, the whole disease thing gets really mixed up. So when nobody calls it a disease because it's something you catch, it's because once, once you have it, um, once you have this issue, and not a, we don't have to call it a disease. It's, it doesn't to me. It doesn't. It doesn't matter either way. But once you have this problem, you basically all always do. Um, and it's also very like some people. I think some people are born a certain way that's a little bit different. And that doesn't mean it's it's a bad thing for anybody out there who is an addict. Um, I have great focus on things that I think people would pick their heads up and, and run away from. Um, it's it's it can be your unfair advantage in your life. So. You don't want to uh, just hmm. basically a, addiction. When you do have this problem, you you definitely want to say I have this problem and this is what I, how to fix it. It's not that you need to say that it's a disease or not. It's mainly I I can do this. I have this problem. What do I do? How do I make it better? And you got to keep going through places like you said. Like you could go outside. And I don't like uh, the AA and NA meetings a lot. And I'm actually not allowed to speak at um, AA anymore because I, I talked about decriminalization and they really didn't like that. Um, <laughs> But really? yes, uh, you, basically there, I, I'm sure there's a, it's just like the cigarette companies running, running certain ads against smoking and things like that. I bet there's tons of money in, uh, from coming from like alcohol companies going into AA meetings and stuff. So I talked about decriminalizing, decriminalizing, uh, weed and decriminalizing, uh, drugs and how it worked in different places. Uh, even, even certain safe, like places for people to do drugs and different things like that that have that have worked really well in certain places and it's not that i think that all this is right it's that i think you know it's, it's worth looking into it's worth seeing that maybe this would work maybe we should uh, decriminalize this because it seems like there's way less addicts in afghanistan i mean uh, or sorry not afghanistan uh, amsterdam <laughs> <laughs> But it, it seems like there's a lot less addicts in certain places where there is decriminalization and people are allowed to really do uh, what they want to do. And also, I, when I was in Amsterdam, I noticed that there is no such thing as meth. Um, there, there's yeah, absolutely. Those things are caused by the criminalization of the safer, much better uh, products out there. And because yes. those become uh, difficult to get and they become more expensive because uh, of all the government in interference that people start using things like bath salts and yes. meth and all kinds of stuff. And and uh, yeah, the, the, the system causes all of its own problems. Um, but I only have about five minutes left here, and, and I wanted to just uh, get some insights onto addiction and stuff like that from you. Um, for example, like what was it that really uh, got you off of heroin? Um, so for me, and I, I think that this is, this is actually a good part of why I think capitalism works, why I think every, everything, uh, anarchism works is because it's really it's 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 very personal um it's becoming interested in yourself and also going through that journey like you if you're an addict out there and you're going through the journey of i'm going i'm drinking every day i'm doing drugs every day i can't stop i don't know what to do um and you and you keep trying you you end up in jail you want to get sober but you can't you end up in rehab you you want to get sober but you didn't and your family hates you and you're and you're and you're going through everything that that i went through at one point um, realize it's it's part of the journey, um, and and I think that's very very important to know is that I can't say myself that there was one thing that woke me up and one day I was um, you know sober. I, I can't say that. I can say that there's a there's a mix of them. There there was a day my my disabled mother. I went to go sell my drum set. My disabled mother drove in front of. Uh, 
uh, the she had a scooter, so she drove her scooter in front of the stairs where my drum set was, and almost fell down the stairs. Um, you know, making sure I didn't do that because she didn't want me doing that anymore. Um, I had friends in my life who were going through terrible things that I couldn't help them with, and at the very least, I do know today that whatever I need to do, I, I am ready. I, I'm I'm ready to go, and I think that's that's very important. Um, so I would just say, just know that the, the there's a journey out there, um, and also focus on. I've always focused on maybe one day I'd be telling my story to somebody else, and it would save somebody else's life. Um, so doing doing my TED talk was the culmination of that. Finally, getting to go all the way out there, tell other people how I was an addict, and how you could also use these failures as your advantage because it's very. It's it's very important to keep fighting because you are worth something. You're not you're not worthless. You're not you're not a slave. You are a free human being on this earth and you can do so much more with your life. Yeah, absolutely. Very motivational. And uh, again, I recommend people check out your TED Talk. It's really good on that topic. And uh, yeah, when it comes to addiction, stuff like that, it is, it's not a cut and dry sort of a thing. As you pointed out, a lot of people think, well, <clears throat> I'm either an addict for life and that, that, that's it. I'm going to die doing this. Or uh, I have to do some sort of really like, you know, extreme thing, like go to AA and all this sort of stuff. And it, it, I find that it's it's a lot more uh, personal uh, usually than that. And, and for me, it was very similar thing. I, I still don't consider myself to be an alcoholic or I didn't think I was an alcoholic, but I was definitely drinking a lot. And, uh, uh, you know, it was one day talking to my daughter, you know, um, just looking at her and sorry, it makes me emotional, but, you know, it's stuff like that. Right. Um, so if you don't, if you're out there and you're addicted to stuff and, um, you know, there is hope. Absolutely. There's hope. Uh, reach out to your friends. If you don't have any friends left, that kind of sucks. And I wonder what kind of friends you really did have, or maybe you did some really bad stuff to them. Maybe now that's why you don't have friends. But, you know, find ways to to get, uh, you know, get a dog, you know, like get a little chihuahua, you know, they just see the little glint in their eyes, give, give you some sort of hope, right? Uh, but it's way more difficult. It's way more <clears throat> gray area than what the government and what the, the culture sort of says, right? It's like, well, you're, you're, you're an alcoholic, so you're screwed. Or yeah. you have to either do this or, or you're going to be screwed forever. It's, it's way more, it's, it's usually a lot of really uh, people who are really screwed up and who need some help. And, uh, uh, you know, so I think that people should definitely check out your TED Talk and uh, see what your motivational stuff is. And um, do you want to yeah. let people know anything else about yourself uh, before we finish up? Yeah, and also it's, it's um, if you have done all those things and, and I've done and, and and like you said you know looking at looking at your daughter and I mean I, I I still get emotional about things that I've done that I can't believe I've done I, I've tried to make them as right as I possibly can at this point but it's if you don't have anybody else left and, and I can definitely say this please call like reach out to me uh you know uh reach out to reach out to somebody who is who has had some sort of problem with drugs because you can you can at least guarantee that they will at least reach out reach back to you talk to you tell you something um because they have been there and most people who've been there want to just help um so the last thing i'd just say about myself i just want to say thanks uh jeff for having me uh i've been um on their newsletter for a long time and following you for a long time it's 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 been an awesome journey um, I, I love what you guys do at TDB. It's been a blast talking to uh, Edmund about trading all the time and talking to everybody in the group. So I, I, I'm very uh, thankful to be on and talking to you. It's been, a, it's been an awesome time. Uh, thank you. Thanks for coming on. And uh, yeah, I just want to mention this. Uh, I did not, didn't know this person. Her name's Sarah Elizabeth Bond, and uh, she was very well known in the voluntarius community. And I don't know exactly what happened, uh, but she's not alive any longer. And it appears it may have been suicide. And you see all the same sort of comments coming out from a lot of people. And that is, uh, why didn't you reach out? So if you're, if you're hurting out there, uh, you know, <laughs> reach out to some people and uh, there is hope uh, you know this whole state of system has caused all these problems we're going to try to get rid of it and that's yeah. why we're here at Anarchast and check out Anarchapogo coming out February 14th to 17th 2019 and thank you very much Jason for coming on and that's it for Anarchast your home for anarchy on the internet peace love and anarchy <laughs>